This is episode four of the We Will Beat IBD podcast. My name is Brian Greenberg, founder of the Intense Intestines Foundation, fellow IBDer, and ostomate. My goal is to help others with Crohn's disease, ulcerated colitis, and ostomies. Together, I believe we can do amazing things. Together, we will beat IBD. Let today's show begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of the We Will Beat IBD podcast. I'm very excited for today's episode. We are going to be talking about dating, relationships, and intimacy with Crohn's disease, ulcerated colitis, and ostomies. The great part about this show is I'm going to be having three guests today. This includes Laura Cox, who you might have seen on Tosh.0 a few years ago, as well as her boyfriend, Ryan Hausman, as well as my girlfriend, Sarah Benjamin, will be joining us too. And this will give us a very interesting dynamic since we'll have two IBD patients with ostomies from each sex as well as supportive partners from each sex to discuss their perspective on how dealing with IBD and an ostomy might be when it comes to relationships and intimacy. So I'm very excited to bring you this show. I hope you guys enjoy it as well. Please remember to check us out at www.intenseintestines.org and also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, whichever one you choose. Let's get started with today's episode of the We Will Beat IBD podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of the We Will Beat IBD podcast. I'm very excited about what we have in store for you today. We're going to be talking about relationships and intimacy with Crohn's disease, ulcerated colitis, and anostomy. The exciting part about today's show is we have four people, two patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerated colitis and ostomies, as well as their partners who are healthy and uh, doing well and supporting them in every way. So I'm going to introduce our first uh, guest, Laura Cox. Laura, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And you are with your boyfriend, Ryan Hausman. How are you today, Ryan? I'm doing excellent. Thank you very much. It's great to have you guys on the show, and the other guest that we have today is my girlfriend, Sarah Benjamin. Hi, everyone. And she even gave you a wave. (laughs) So we're going to jump right into the topics that we have for everyone today, and we're hoping that we're able to touch on a lot of things to help a lot of people. And one of the first topics we want to talk about is how to prepare for a first date, which is something that I know I've been nervous about. Laura, have you ever had nerves going into a first date with your uh, ulcerated colitis anostomy? Oh, definitely. I mean, added to the the nerves that any first date brings up, um, definitely. I was nervous because there, my diet is very, very restricted, so I didn't really know how to talk about that if it came up. But um, really, I just kind of found a really great system for me where I could kind of control the output of my ostomy and um, eat find ways around eating what I could eat. Of course. And that's actually one of the things that I was going to talk about is kind of eating safe food leading up to the first date, because you don't want to be surprised or all of a sudden have a food going through you, which you might not be used to. So are there some like safe foods that you know you eat going up to a date? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, So I definitely try to stay away from any foods that cause odor, first of all, just in case. Um, And that's for me and for a lot of people, it's things like fish and eggs. So usually what I like to do is kind of a pasta, maybe put a little bit of butter and cheese in it. But that's a really safe food for me. It kind of also slows down the output. Since I have an ileostomy, the noodles kind of slow it down. So that's usually my safe food. No, I actually go the same route before my first dates, and hopefully I won't have another first date, but um, <laughs> I have to do the same thing. So do you, just out of curiosity, Lord, do you ever take Imodium or anything to slow yourself down before you head out to a first date as well? Oh, absolutely. I take Imodium probably one to two times a day anyways, but I will take Imodium about 25 minutes before I leave for a first date. That just kind of um, helps everything slow down. But I also actually take Gas-X before a first date as well, just because, you know, um, it does seem to kind of help with my um, stoma making noise during a date. So that's also something I do. Interesting. I've actually never taken Gas-X. That's something that... uh... Maybe I'll try not for dating necessarily, but just in general. I I don't really have a noisy stoma. Have you ever really had your stoma make enough noise to where it's noticeable during a date? 
Absolutely. Um, and also it likes to make noise when there is nothing going on around me. Like, for example, in a lecture hall when we're all taking an exam, um, that just seems to be the pattern when my stoma likes to act up is when it's really quiet. So, so it seems like um, your stoma kind of knows when the moment of silence is. <laughs> it really <laughs> seems like it. So, um, Generally, if it does make noise during a day and, and you know, that's that's something that can happen, I just say that my stomach is growling or that I'm hungry or just say, oh, excuse me, <laughs> you know, just kind of <laughs> makes sense completely. So yeah. also, just out of curiosity, Laura, do you like to have like a fresh ostomy on before you go out to a first date? Not necessarily for intimacy reasons, but just to know that everything's kind of fresh in every way for, you know, when you're getting ready to meet somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not only do I like to have a fresh ostomy to know that it won't leak, but also, at least personally for, for women, um, the first day that you have your ostomy, if you have a filter, it's a lot flatter um, and it lets out more more gas. So um, I can wear tighter clothes on a first or second day of having a new ostomy versus, you know, the third or fourth day. So it allows me to wear what I want to wear on a date as well. Makes sense completely. I don't really have the problem of wearing form-fitting clothes to dates. <laughs> right. I can completely uh -huh. see that, uh, you know, for women especially, that they might want to have a fresh ostomy on so then they can wear more form-fitting clothes possibly. Right. Um, so do you ever, like, kind of plan ahead and make sure you arrive to a date early so you know where the bathroom is and you're kind of able to go to the bathroom before everything gets started? Uh, you know, I'm kind of a chronically late person, so... Um... I, I don't always, but usually, and what we did for our first date is that we went to a place that I have been many times. I'm very familiar with it. I know the bathrooms are nice. There are lots of stalls. I know exactly where the bathroom is. So that's something you can maybe think about on a first date is, can I pick the place so that I'm familiar, I'm in a comfort zone, and also I know there are a lot of restrooms. No, that makes sense completely. I, I always <laughs> kind of pick the safe place that I know as well. So just out of curiosity for Ryan and Sarah, and I'll ask you first, Ryan, um, when Laura walked in on your first date, were you able to notice anything? Were you just, or was it basically <laughs> just, you know, waiting for her to say something? Uh, first thing I noticed was her smile, for sure. Aww. But um, I had no idea, not even the, the slimmest clue that she had an ostomy or had any chronic illness whatsoever, you know. Um her confidence and just the way she brought herself into the room, there was no way to detect anything like that. It actually took three dates before I called her out on her, uh, what do you call those, Spanx? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I wear Spanx. And so um, we were hugging, and I was wearing kind of a tight shirt, and he said, what's with the onesie? Yeah, I just kind of came out and said it. And when she, uh, it was, I don't know, it was on our third date fourth date or something like that and yeah so when I asked her I was comfortable with any uh any I thought she was just being self-conscious I thought she just thought she was fat <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to first of all make sure she knew she wasn't fat and then uh and then I also wanted to to see what was going on and when she showed me her J pouch my no, ostomy pouch, ostomy yeah. pouch mm -hmm. um obviously that opened up kind of the the can of worms that, that is her condition and uh i don't know it kind of made me fall in love with her more interesting yeah i mean that's something we're going to talk about very soon is just you know kind of bringing up the topic and how to discuss it with a person but it kind of seemed like everything happened very naturally for you guys and obviously you weren't able to really notice it um sarah were you able to notice anything with my Crohn's disease or ostomy when i came in well, I will say you didn't follow your own advice. You did not get there before me. I beat you to the restaurant. So I would also say, no, I didn't notice anything. And to be honest, most people probably won't. Yeah. So as much as you might prepare because you have all these things you're concerned about, I'm going to bet the other person is not going to be that mm -hmm. observant unless they have experience with it, in which case they're probably a lot more open to it than you would otherwise assume a normal person would be. So yeah. it's probably not as evident as you think. Even if you have to go to the bathroom a lot, the other person <laughs> might just think your beer ran through you or <laughs> you had a lot of water that day. So I wouldn't worry that much. It's going to be all in your head. The other person won't know. 
No, I think it's really, you know, hard for someone else to tell, especially with an ostomy. And everybody thinks, oh, if I get an ostomy, everybody's going to know about it. But all my friends look at me and sometimes they even ask me if my ostomy is on at that point. <laughs> I have to say, yeah, my ostomy is always on. It's there 24-7. But it's so, you know, concealed and so flat to your body that it's really hard for people to see. So I think a lot of people, you know, when they are worried about a first date, they don't have to be because it's really hard to see. Um, and if you prepare mm-hmm. properly, if you don't have an ostomy and you have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you know, you can still go through the proper preparations to make sure you can possibly slow your body down a little bit or go to a place that you know is safe and uh, you're aware of where the bathrooms are to make life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go to the next topic now and we're gonna talk about when to discuss your IBD or ostomy and how to discuss it as well. So I've always found that I'm able to kind of feel out a person and become comfortable with them pretty quickly. Um, At what point did you feel comfortable with Ryan, Laura, and and feel really okay with telling him about everything. It kind of sounded like he almost kind of called you out on a little bit, which probably made it a little (laughs) bit easier. It definitely did. You know, Ryan and I um, got very close very quickly, uh, but I think it actually happened at the best time possible. It was three or four dates in. We had already um, established that we enjoyed spending time together, and so I felt comfortable and... um, I I felt like, you know, whatever I threw at him, he would kind of be able to take. And, and so I just kind of talked about it very openly. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't sugarcoat anything. And he was really great about it. That that probably makes it a lot easier. I think the first time I talked to Sarah about my Crohn's disease was actually shortly on in our first date, because she knew I had a nonprofit to help people with Crohn's disease and also right class and ostomies already. I didn't tell her about my ostomy until I think the third or fourth date. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was when we were actually, you know, starting to make out a little bit and and starting the intimacy (laughs) process. But at that point, I kind of knew I had to tell her the next step and talk to her about my ostomy, which was, you know, I I just had to make that step. So I know there are a lot of ways that people think, you know, someone might react. And I think they're fearful of, you know, if I bring this up, how is the other person going to take this news of having Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or an ostomy in some cases. So Ryan, what was kind of your reaction when Laura first told you, yeah, I have ulcerative colitis and I have an ostomy? Uh, Well, I wasn't too educated on the subject. I I really didn't know what it was. Um, I didn't, I hadn't really seen this before with uh, any of any of the people directly in my life. I'd never seen an ostomy bag and I'd, I'd heard of uh, Crohn's and IBD, but I'd, I'd never actually seen anything quite like this where you know on our second date I cooked us dinner at my house and and she couldn't eat the asparagus um <laughs> but we weren't at a t- at a point yet where she was comfortable telling me what was going on so you know I just kind of thought she just didn't like asparagus or didn't like my cooking <laughs> but that's that's kind of uh, neither here nor there I, I suddenly realized that this girl brought a lot more to the table than just met the eye. I mean, somebody who has something like this, your day-to-day life is, is far more challenging than, than my day-to-day life. Um, so I guess I kind of started thinking about, well, I've obviously I like this girl and I want to spend more time with her, but I also started thinking about ways I could make her, her struggle a little bit easier for her on a, on a day-to-day basis. So I guess my reaction to how, what she told me was, um, I don't want to say sympathy, I don't want to. I don't want to say empathy. I want to say I just wanted to be there for her, and, and I wanted to be something strong with something so shaky. You know, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. Right. No, I like think a- you're right on there. I mean, I think it's a. It's really hard for someone to kind of take that news at first, but for the most part, people react in a positive way. I haven't had too many people react in a negative way. Uh, Sarah, did you kind of have a similar reaction when I told you about my IBD and ostomy? Well. I'm fairly familiar with this world. My best friend from law school, uh, he doesn't have it, but his family does actually. And I think during our first or second year of law school, his dad actually almost died from complications because of the (laughs) surgery. Um, It wasn't about his Crohn's. The surgery was related to it, but uh, it was poor management at the hospital actually. So I was fairly familiar with Crohn's and IBD. And when he told me he had an ostomy, 
my reaction was kind of, okay, great, could we keep making out? And (laughs) that kind of freaked him out a little bit, to be honest. Um, You know, I looked and he was wondering why I was just like, all right, that's great. Um, Let's keep going. But, you know, and he kept pausing to be like, are you sure you don't have any questions? Do you want to talk about this? And I was like, no, I'm familiar with it. I said, you know, my mom actually passed away from colon cancer, so I'm very familiar Mm -hmm. with just issues in that area. um, And I knew what an ostomy was. And so actually, I think it was a bigger deal to him than it was to me. I think it is sometime. Laura, maybe you and I can touch on this a little bit more. I mean, when I not only enter into a relationship, but just in general, my IBD and ostomy, I feel like, you know, has a bigger impact on me emotionally than it does someone else. Do you feel the same way? Oh, absolutely. And I think that um, a lot of people think that it's going to be a bigger deal in the relationship than it actually is. Um, Every relationship has challenges and, and this just turns out to be ours. And I really feel like, you know, of course it affects me more, but it definitely does affect him as we go through our relationship. But it it comes from a place of wanting to support me and wanting to do as many things as he can for me. But to that note, I just want to say that, you know, sometimes when you tell someone about your Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or your ostomy, I think the best way to approach it is really matter of fact. I think it's confident. And, and also, I always try to find a positive spin. I know Crohn's and colitis, sometimes it feels like there isn't a positive spin to be had. But um, for instance, for my ulcerative colitis, I told him, you know, I want to be a a counselor, a psychologist, and this gives me so much more empathy. And my ostomy saved my life. And so now he thinks of my ostomy as as something that is so good and so necessary that really it's just another part of our relationship. I completely agree. So just out of curiosity, did you prepare any, you know, statements or did you think in your head, how am I going to bring this up? Because I think about it the same way. I feel like if I'm confident about it and I portray it in a positive light and or, or a positive way, the other person is going to say, okay, well, if these people can deal with it, then it's fine. Everything's going to be okay. But I feel like if someone brings their IBD up and they sound scared or they sound upset or they sound like this is going to be really hard, then obviously the other person's reaction is going to be, well, how am I supposed to deal with this person can't deal with it themselves. So do you kind of think of a certain way to bring it up sometimes? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I always try to bring it up. I know this sounds so funny, but over a meal, if I can, because my limited diet is a good segue into why I can't eat certain foods. So I always kind of try to bring it up over a meal. And so my whole thing is just to just to be educational <laughs> at all times and um and then put a positive spin on it like I said you know I was diagnosed when I was 18 with a chronic illness and my own immune system essentially attacks my my colon and um it got so bad that they had to take it out and now I have this thing called an ostomy and then I of course ask what if they know what an ostomy is and if he didn't which he didn't I kind of explained what it was and And I always, always end with, you know, my life is so much better because of my ostomy or, you know, for someone who has Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that that doesn't have an ostomy, just something like it's it's taught me a lot of lessons or something of that sense. So I think it did give him the confidence to know that it's something that I can handle and it's something that he can handle. And I think you touch on a lot of great points. The educational aspect, I think we always kind of have to be ready and prepared to answer questions. Mm-hmm. And I think in my respect or in my uh, experience with Sarah, yeah, when, when she said, okay, can we still make out? I did kind of <laughs> say, is this, is this really happening? I mean, she's got to have questions. Everybody has questions. Right. But she, you know, was already educated on the topic. But in our minds, we have to always be ready to answer questions of all types. And, you know, I was a little bit shocked that she didn't have any questions. So it kind of caught me off guard. Ryan, I mean, did you have, you, it seems like you had some questions for Laura right away. But <laughs> how quickly were you able to process that? Because one of the things that I think we all have to realize is some people might have a reaction of some sort. And it might not be negative, but we kind of have to give them time 
to take in all the information we're giving them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I littered her with questions. Um, <laughs> as I said, I didn't have any experience in this. And so when she said, you know, that she had this condition, we went into right right off the bat, what were the foods she could eat and what are the foods she couldn't eat? I mean, how often did she go to the bathroom? Uh, <laughs> You know, how many times in the night does she have to wake up and go to the bathroom? These were things that I was thinking about that, again, goes back to her day-to-day challenge, the things that I don't really have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. I just I just wanted to do anything I could to make her life easier. And um, so, yeah, it was lots of questions, lots of questions. No, So, so Laura, what was the uh, strangest question that, that Ryan had to ask you? Ooh, I don't know. It's been it's been almost two years, so it's hard to think back to that. But um, no, I mean, I guess one thing that we always do joke about is that I've got the cleanest butt in the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we had to kind of he had to learn as we went. You know, so you you don't ever go to the bathroom out of the normal orifice that you go to the bathroom out of. And so you know, it's been a process of education, but really. Um, I don't know, babe. What do you think the well, latest I mean, question was? At the end of the day, uh, yeah, I was trying to figure. I was figuring out why why she had to have an ostomy bag, and, and she did a great job of painting the picture for me that uh, that it's not a negative thing. That that without it, she very well could not be alive. And um, so when everything is functioning properly, <laughs> you know, we get very excited about that because. If everything's working correctly, then then that makes her life a little bit easier. What it come, came down to for me was how to make or how to help help be there for the girl I was in love with, you know, and all the time in the world. Or, you know, I, I wanted to be the one to get up and get her a glass of water. So it, in the middle of the night, so it would save her a trip or, <laughs> you know, I mean, just just little things because battling this thing every day, um, I know it can be exhausting. It can. It can definitely take its toll on a patient. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard for us because sometimes we don't necessarily want the help all the time. But uh, I completely understand what you're saying because, you know, sometimes Sarah wants to take care of me. And, you know, I just want to get my own glass of water. But (laughs) she's, you know, perfectly capable, obviously. And I might be a little bit sick. So she'll jump up and, and get me what I need, which is really, really nice sometimes. So, it sounds like Lori obviously, you know, got a really good catch with Ryan because he, you know, wants to be there for you. I, I think the the hardest question that I've ever gotten, and it was really weird because, you know, I was talking about my Crohn's disease and ostomy with a prior girlfriend, and you know, she had a lot of questions like you, Ryan, and she kind of littered me with question after question. And I, I said, so is that it? Are we all done? Do you, do you kind of have a good idea? And she was like, yeah, I think I have a good idea, but I just have one more question. And I said, okay, shoot. And she goes, well, if you drink blue Gatorade, does it come out blue? (laughs) You know, and I I think, you know, with these conversations, we kind of have to find a way to have a little bit of humor with them. Because if we don't, it's just going to kind of bring the mood down and it's going to make things that much harder to deal with. So I think it's very important to kind of be able to go with the flow and whatever questions you're asked. I didn't have a lot of questions from Sarah, which made my life very easy, but Mm -hmm. as she stated, it kind of caught me off guard and and put me in a state of shock because I was ready to have this long conversation. I guess she just wanted to make out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I will say, you know, I was, as I said, somewhat informed, and I think a lot of it is you learn day to day. You know, questions might come up that for instance, how often does he change his ostomy? There are different kinds. You know, I know enough to know what it is, but not necessarily the mechanism. But I really didn't need to know that in the moment. Um, mm-hmm. And I've certainly learned a lot as we go. You know, maybe the next week I made dinner one night and I really like Brussels sprouts. Was that something that he could eat? I like vegetables. He doesn't eat a lot and that's okay. And but one of the things that made it really easy for me was the fact that Brian approached it with a lot of positivity. It wasn't, you know, you've both talked about how you go in with sort of an educational mindset and that's good because he sort of said, well, I have an ostomy, but you know that you know, we were going to the same gym at the same time, actually. Um, So we would see each other there in the mornings. And so I already knew how active he was. I knew that it didn't Mm. affect that. You know, he was training for a half Ironman. So 
it was one of those things that I didn't really question how it impacted his ability to live a normal life because I already had evidence of that. And I think maybe mm -hmm. people might not if it's earlier on or you haven't shared enough of that part of your life. So you should be able to talk about that. No, I mean, it, I definitely saw Sarah at the gym quite a bit. So I think she knew that I was very active. And it was always that awkward moment when you see the person in the gym that you're starting to date. And do you want to hug them when you're all sweaty? I or did, did not just want that. Wave? <laughs> I, I didn't like that. And he was all about that. And I was like, please don't touch me. I'm disgusting and sweaty. <laughs> so, But I, I think Sarah brought up a good point, you know, in the moment. You know, I wanted to talk about things and she kind of already knew, but my head was overactive and thinking about all the things that, you know, might happen or might go on. Laura, do you ever have like an overactive mind sometimes, even though, you know, you know, everything's <laughs> going to be all right, but you have things that are going through your mind when you're meeting a person for the first time, right? Yeah. I mean, and Ryan's over here just nodding his head because I'm, I just tend to be like that as a person. There's a million things going on in my head and I'm always worrying. Um, but to that point, I think that people who have IBD or who have ostomies, um, we have to be a lot more in tune with our bodies. And so we may notice things that the other person really does not notice. So, um, you know, I hear and I feel every gurgle that my body makes, every crack that my joints make. And, you know, it's just other people are not paying that close of attention. And I also think it's a great point that Sarah brought up that Sometimes, even though you want to get everything out at once, it's not always good to overwhelm them with information. Answer the questions they have in that moment about IBD or, or an ostomy. And then, you know, just say, if you don't have any more questions now, but later you do, just, just ask me. That's no problem. And definitely that has come up throughout our relationship, I would say, you know, as he understands more, his questions get more in depth. And, and that's great, because he has such a great understanding of it now. Yeah, I think it's really important once you find a partner who has a great understanding and kind of wants to know the intricacies of what it's like to live, you know, day to day with these diseases or day to day with an ostomy, it makes our lives much easier. Because, you know, like Ryan said, they, they want to be there for us. They want to help us out. They want to try to make our lives a little bit easier. It warms my heart every time Sarah says, you know, let me go take care of this for you or just sit on the couch. I know you're having a bad day, but mm -hmm. it makes our lives a lot easier. And it sounds like Ryan has tried to make your life as easy as possible as well, Laura. Yeah, he has. And, and you know, it has been like phases of education to you kind of have to, and I hate asking for help. I hate it so much, but I realize now that in certain instances I have to. And so one day he made plans without asking me and I was exhausted. I didn't feel well. My arthritis was acting up. Um, I could tell I was in a flare and he's like, okay, are you ready to go? And I just start crying. <laughs> And he's like, oh, my gosh, what's happening? And I, I just kept saying, I don't have enough spoons. And um, he had no idea what I was talking about. So I sat him down and I had him read the spoon theory. Um, for people who may not be familiar, it's essentially about how, the energy level of people with chronic illness and how everything we do takes some energy, takes some spoons. And so I look at him halfway through reading and he's, he's like tearing up and, and, um, he now all the time before we do something asks, okay, but how are your spoons? And so that was such, I think that was like a pivotal point in our relationship for me, because that was the moment I felt like he didn't just understand my ostomy, but he understood the daily implications of my disease. And that was huge. That's a great way to put it too. I, I, I haven't heard of the spoon theory yet. I kind of heard, heard other theories like that. We only have so many, you know, energy units in the day, basically. Exactly. It's kind of the same thing. You know, if, if we use those energy units up, you know, there might be plans at the end of the day, you know, or the night where we just, we, we have to cancel because we're just yeah. too tired. The fatigue sets in. And, you know, there's only so much we could do in a day with our Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or ostomy. So right. I think it's, you know, something that we have to learn is how to budget our time and also budget our energy. But it's not the end of the world if we have to cancel, you know. Usually our partners are really understanding and fine with it because they, they know that we have a disease and our lives aren't normal like everybody else's is our, at times. 
Right. So, Laura, have you ever met anybody or gone out on a first date where their reaction has kind of been bad or, you know, in a negative way? I, I like you, I, I read people. And if I don't feel comfortable telling them about my ostomy, I figure this isn't going to work anyway. So I just save myself the whole experience. But um, the only person I've ever had a bad reaction to is actually one of my friends. I knew I had a very tight knit close group during my time of disease and also time of surgery. And so this person knew me before surgery and he knew how sick I was. You know, I had the steroid face and he wasn't the most understanding of friends. He was kind of a friend of a friend. And and then I got this, the surgery and all of my friends were over and he was there and I was kind of, this was shortly after surgery and I started to explain to them what it was and he legitimately said, ew, that's gross. And at this wow. point, you know, I was, I was so freshly out of surgery that I wasn't ready for that. And so I just kind of turned to him and I was like, you know what's not gross? Being alive. <laughs> And I kind of just left it at that. I'm not good at comebacks, but um, it's pretty good. I, I think that's pretty decent. <laughs> so, thank you. I appreciate that. But you know, it kind of shut him up and made him think like more than just like the the looks of it. Um, but that was my only experience. Have you ever had experiences like that? No, I haven't had too many. I mean, like you, I've kind of always put a positive twist and a positive light on what I've gone through, but. You know, I do read people pretty quickly, and if I could tell they're not going to react in a, in a certain way, I pretty much write them off. I say, you know, if, if they're not going to be worth my time and energy as a person if I know that they're going to have a reaction as a certain way. And I think a lot of people will kind of react in a certain way to other topics you might talk about beforehand. And if you see how they react to other topics, you might know or be able to see how they would react to the news of what I have Crohn's disease or I have ulcerative colitis and whether or not they're going to be worth that entire topic of conversation. Like you said, I mean, there are a lot of times where I have found myself the same way. I'm not going to bring this up because there's just no point. It's just going to be a waste of my time and energy for someone who's not going to understand it properly. So I feel like I'm in the same boat. And, you know, a while back, I was actually out with a friend and I was really nervous because it was right before my ostomy surgery. I said to her, you know, am I going to be able to meet somebody? Am I going to be able to actually have a normal relationship? And I I said to her, I think it's going to keep me from meeting the right person. And I remember very intensely what she said because it really struck me right in the right way. And she just said, your IBD won't keep you from meeting the right person it will keep you from meeting the wrong person. Mm -hmm. That kind of really resonated with me. I mean, what are your thoughts when you hear that that saying, Laura? You know, um, my mom said something kind of the same, but not as sophisticated, maybe. (laughs) She said that my IBD was a jerk repellent, like a jerk repellent. (laughs) So um, so not as as um, sophisticated as your friend put it, but, but the same idea where, you know, people who aren't willing to, to deal with this. And this is kind of funny to say this so, so soon on, but you know, the, the whole idea is in sickness and in health. And so we're already figuring that out way before we even think about getting engaged or getting married. It's, it's finding someone who will be there in sickness and in health. And that is something that is so real for people who have chronic illness. And, and I think that really in a way, yeah, it it is a way to keep us from meeting the wrong person because the wrong people will just keep going. The yeah. right people will stick. And and the fact that I've always found is when I, I meet the wrong person or, you know, I can tell a person might not be okay with my IBD or ostomy, you know, I just, I don't want to waste my energy on them because I know that they're just going to bring a negativity to my life probably. So I just don't waste my time. Like you, you kind of just read the person and just go on from, from there and, and move on to the next one. So, you know, obviously in any relationship, communication is key, whether you have a disease or not. But I think with our diseases and situations, I think communication, you know, has to be put more of importance on it because if we don't communicate what's going on with our bodies or what's going on in our minds, it's going to be that much harder for our partners to kind of 
be in the relationship with us. So Ryan, have you had, you know, a good experience of Laura communicating with you and, and obviously makes your <laughs> life a little bit easier when she communicates, right? Yeah, we've got a, a pretty good open door policy. Um, I don't, I don't like, I don't like finding out through the grapevine that she's in pain or doesn't want to do something that day or would, or would rather just stay in bed for a little while in the morning, things like that. We're really, really good at communicating, um, exactly how she's feeling throughout the day. I will say, though, that it took him t- telling me a couple times to be like, you need to tell me when you don't feel well, because I tend to to hide that from my loved ones. And so Ryan looked at me and he said, it makes my life easier if you tell me how you're actually feeling. And so that was a really big wake up call to me that I need to communicate how I feel. Yeah, and don't don't put so much merit into how other people feel about how you feel today. I completely agree with you. I think that's probably, for most IBD patients, going to be a big thing because it has been for both of you, apparently, Uh, (laughs) because I've had to have numerous conversations with Brian about, you need to let me know what's going on, and if you're not feeling well or you're concerned about something, you have to talk to me about it. And even if it makes me nervous or concerned or if I need to process it, that's okay because I need to know about it and it's not good for you to hide it from me. And also I'm allowed to be upset if there's potentially Mm -hmm. something that's hurting you or upset with you. And that's something that he's really come a long way on since we first started dating because, you know, Laura, you said you don't like to ask for help and he's exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, And at one point he was like, you don't have to treat me like I'm a baby. And my response was, I'm not treating you like a baby. You know, if you want to do things, go ahead and do it. If you want to get up and cook dinner, that's fine. But I feel fine. I like cooking and I'm happy to do that to make your life easier and to take care of you. You know, you want to take care of the person that you love and be there for them. And it makes me feel better to be able to do little things like making him dinner or the other night I made breakfast for dinner. So Brinner was what we had. (laughs) I think, you know, Sarah and Laura touch on a point that is hard for me because I, yeah, sometimes I'm not 100% open and I do need to get better at that. I think all IBD patients have to be a little bit more open I think my problem is also I'm a guy, so uh, we're not quite as open as females necessarily, but you know, I think we all kind of have to learn our technique to be open because it's something, it's a progress, you know, it's, a, it's something that has to happen uh, naturally. And, you know, sometimes we have these partners like Sarah and Ryan that kind of push us along the way to learn a little bit faster and be open about it even more, because if we're not open and honest about our disease, it's that much harder. So it sounds kind of like Ryan has pushed you a little bit also, Laura. Oh, absolutely. He is the better communicator of the two of us. And he's definitely taught me a lot about how to communicate, you know, because like I said about the spoon thing, I just broke down and cried. (laughs) I was like, but you don't even understand. And he's like, well, help me understand. And I'm like, oh, that's a novel idea. Actually talk to you. Okay. Um, So, so that definitely has has helped me just knowing that he wants to know and he he is stressed out when he doesn't know and you know almost every day we joke about it because one time he asked me how I was feeling and how my belly was and everything and and I was probably hormonal or something and I cried because I said you never ask me about my arthritis (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and here he was being really sweet and really thoughtful. And I was like, yeah, but you don't ask me. And I think for me, it was just I felt like he still didn't understand every struggle that I went through. And so instead of crying, I could have just said, oh, I'm feeling good in that way. But, you know, my joints are really swollen today. I'm having a hard time walking without pain, you know, so it's definitely been a learning process to me. And he's been so good about holding my hand through every step of the way, but he really has pushed me to communicate in a healthier way. And I think it makes our lives that much easier. 
um, especially when you have a partner that's very understanding and wants to push us in the correct way to get us to open up a little bit more. So just out of curiosity, when you guys are communicating, uh, you know, do you have a sense of humor about it sometimes? I mean, <laughs> these diseases, obviously any disease is a serious topic, but I feel like if we don't have a little bit of a sense of humor or at least be a little bit light on our feet about it and, and be willing to laugh about it, you know, it makes our lives harder. So do you guys have a sense of humor within your relationship? Oh, yeah, yeah. Things pop up all the time. Um, I love I love making her laugh about it because when she's talking to, I mean, for her job, when she's talking to nurses or doctors or patients, it's a very, very serious conversation. And it's very serious for both, for all parties involved. But when it's me and her, I, I try and, and make light of it the best I can. One of the one of the best examples I can think of right now is um, when we're having trouble figuring out what to do, um, you know, the, the common term is go with your gut. <laughs> but what I say is, you know, we're going to go with our half a gut today, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and to trust your half a guts because it's, it's, uh, it's important to do that. That's the only one I can think of right now. Well, I think of, um, you know, we talked about our stomas making noise. My stoma makes quite a bit of noise. And so whenever that happens, uh, you know, we either say, oh, Trixie, Trixie is the name of my stoma. Trixie's just talking. Trixie wants to say hello. Or we just talk about, oh, these are normal bodily functions. That's a good thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, that that is that is that is good. And whenever whenever everything's going according to plan, we get excited about that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there's there's a lot we there's a lot of humor added in because it's way more fun to laugh with it than cry against it you know mm-hmm. exactly we only live once so you know there's no reason to really obviously we're going to have times where we need to cry about it but you know for the most part it's a lot easier and makes our partner's lives easier if we have a sense of humor about it as well i think the thing that sarah and i joke about most often is probably my butt because <laughs> technically i mean i had a proctectomy last year so i don't have an anus and she always says oh i, I like your butt and i said you mean the one that's non-existent? And we kind of just always laugh about that a little bit. And also yeah. something that you said earlier also, Laura, is just that, you know, I have the cleanest butt in the world. It doesn't <laughs> smell. Nothing comes out of it. It's just there. It's kind of not fair because yeah. as the girl in the relationship, like, how is it that I'm the only one who can fart? Like, I can't blame it on him. Like, it's just not fair. When we were first dating, it was like... You know, you dread that moment, and maybe you guys don't know anymore, but you dread that moment when you're going to fart in front of the other person for the first time. And now it's just not fair. It's, it's just not I fair. I can totally relate to that, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's another thing that I like to tell him is that my butt is just for his viewing pleasure. It's literally not there for anything else. It's just for his viewing pleasure. And he is so welcome. Yeah. You are so welcome. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I also sometimes joke around with her, you know, I would love to fart again. I'd love to go to the bathroom, but unfortunately I can't. So it's just something that she has to enjoy for the both of us. Yes, we're very, (laughs) very open about bodily functions in this household. Oh, yes. (laughs) Or my bodily functions, anyways. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, it's nice to have that understanding, you know, partner that we can laugh about, you know, all these things with. And not only, you know, have them by our sides in the hard times, but also have them by our sides when we just want to laugh a little bit about it, whether it's poop jokes or fart jokes or non-existent butt jokes, you know, it, it's, it's <laughs> fun to be able to laugh and, and kind of roll with the roller coaster and, and still have fun with it. So obviously there are a lot of people out there that probably have questions about intimacy and how it works exactly. And Sarah and I were talking about this topic last night and she's apparently even been asked by her friends, well, how do you guys do it? And obviously, we just do it like everybody else. But some people need to be educated about that a little bit and, and, you know, learn that, you know, sex for us and intimacy for us is, is pretty much the same thing. There aren't too many things that change. But I think it's very important to kind of have an open talk before you take that next step. So, you know, what was your talk like, Laura and Ryan, when you guys had to take that next step and, and you kind of had to prepare them possibly for the little differences that come up when having intimacy with an ostomy or an IBD? Um, you know, I don't 
think he really had that many questions. I really explained that it had nothing to do with the the womanly parts. Um, so it it really wasn't a thing for us. I mean, the only thing I can think of is you know that I just told him you know sometimes it it gets in the way, but I'll just I'll just move it. You know, like that's that's kind of the the biggest thing. Um, although I do want to talk about really quickly that sometimes. Um, due to scar tissue and things like that, there is a little bit of pain during sex. And so we just have kind of discovered what positions make the pain and we avoid them or we're really careful when we're in them. Um, so really it's a, it's a learning process with your partner, but he didn't have many intimacy questions. I don't think right off the bat, he was just kind of like, all right, let's do this. This is great. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. It probably makes your life a lot easier. So Ryan, you were kind of just, you know, completely open and, and ready to whatever happened uh, when it came to intimacy with Laura. Well, yeah, I I, uh, I put, kind of put myself in her shoes and, and thought, you know, if, if I had an ostomy bag and I was trying to make love to my girlfriend, um, obviously I wouldn't want her focusing on my ostomy bag. <clears throat> I'd want her focusing on all the other good things that we'd be enjoying together. <laughs> and so um, that's, that's what I really try to do for the first couple of weeks. Uh, really just make sure that I wasn't giving any of uh, her, her bag, any extra attention as far as uh, like, like it being a distraction. I thought that it would, it would definitely be an, a negative impact if, if I let the, the bag distract me from what I was trying to, to accomplish during our intimate moments together. Um, but then of course, you know, after about a week, I don't, I don't even see it anymore. I don't even notice that it's there. So, um, you know, that made it, that made it really easy for me is just to, to imagine what it was like to feel someone staring at you. Uh, and I just didn't want her to ever feel that way. I made it really easy and just forget it was there all, all together. We just no, it do probably our makes, you know, our lives a lot easier because we kind of feel a little bit vulnerable, the fact that we do have this extra little appendage kind of hanging from exactly. us. Exactly. And, you know, mm -hmm. if, if someone's not paying attention to us, we're kind of able to focus on exactly what you said, kind of like the mission that we have to accomplish. Right. Instead of thinking about, okay, well, what are they doing? What are they thinking about? You know, are they thinking about my ostomy? Are they looking at my ostomy? It makes our lives a lot easier, especially when we're getting intimate did you guys have any talks with regards to, you know, what positions might work or what positions don't? Because there's a couple of positions that Sarah and I have to make minor adjustments to. But for the most part, we don't really have it affect, you know, a majority of the positions that I would say most people do on a regular basis. I don't know what crazy positions there are out there with Kama Sutra and everything. But <laughs> for the most part, we kind of stick to... The basics and wow, uh, okay, so he just made us sound super vanilla. That's <laughs> <what's done. laughs> but you know, did you guys have a conversation about you know little adjustments that you might have to make? Yeah, no, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, um, so we have just about just probably one position that that really is affected, and so I just turned to him and was like, hey, we got to be gentle when we're in this position. And so that's pretty much all I had to say because he, he worries about, you know, me hurting. And so we really know that these are the positions that may cause a problem and we just need to be careful when we're in them. But really, we it's not affected our sex life whatsoever unless I'm actually like sick and in the ER or something. Um, but really, it, it hasn't affected our sex life. And if I may, it, you guys are definitely not vanilla. I think we're both, we're all a little bit more traditional. Um, <laughs> where, you know, there's no there's no swings hanging from the ceiling or anything like that. But, but it's, if you're into that kind of stuff, I'm sure. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But I'm sure that sure. it could actually happen. You know, if that's something that people with ostomies want to do or want to try, I don't think the ostomy or the IBD, if you're feeling well enough, will will get in the way of that, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That, that's kind of what I was trying to say is don't make it sound like the only thing you can do is missionary. <laughs> right. I think, uh, I really don't think it impacts it that much. I mean, Brian likes to have a band or something so that it's not just loose and moving around. And to be honest, I, I don't even notice it. 
I'm very used to it. We joke that that's his lingerie for me. <laughs> um, but other than that, I mean, it really does not impact our intimate life at all. Uh, clearly, I chose the wrong words. But yeah, I mean, if you're able to be active and have an active lifestyle, I, I'm, I'm guessing Sarah probably imagined, well, if he could do a half Ironman and swim, bike and run, he could probably do most positions and be okay with you know any parts of intimacy that we want to take part of so you know our transition was pretty easy uh like she said i do like to wear a band not necessarily to hide it visually but just to kind of keep it steady in one position um laura do you use any bands or intimacy wear or lingerie i mean how what's your um experience been as a woman because i know women are a little bit different than men when it comes to intimacy and sexual relations right um you know I really don't use anything on a normal basis just because it's more comfortable and I feel comfortable with Brian. Um, we did try one of the, the wraps from Awesome Secrets and it was pretty, I mean, it was nice, but it was just an extra step and sometimes the moment hits and you don't want to go to the other room and put something on. And um, so usually I don't wear anything, but there are wraps and things that people can do. My only thing is that when the moment does hit, I will say, babe, I got to go to the bathroom. I like to completely empty it, even if it's not very full, just because that makes me more comfortable. I don't want something heavy hanging off of me. I don't want, you know, it to distract him. So that is the one thing I do to prepare for intimacy is just go to the bathroom and empty it. I'm the same way. I like to go to the bathroom before anything gets started too serious. And sometimes if I can plan it out right, you know, if I know I'm about to initiate something, I can go to the bathroom without her even knowing yet, which is always nice. But You know, I think it's very important for us to prepare properly, you know, when we know relations are going to possibly start because we don't want to have to take a break necessarily and, 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 you know, make the mood stop basically for, you know, when we're ready to go. And I think it's an important process to kind of be ready for anything. So did you guys ever have a conversation with regards to, you know, worst case scenario, this might happen, but it's an extremely rare case. Um, well, I definitely leaked on him once, um, during an intimate moment. So we've, we've had that conversation. Um, so I don't know, did we talk about that before it happened? Um, not, not really. I think that it was kind of assumed that that, that can happen. Um, and so when I saw that there was a little bit of my bag, excrements on him I just (laughs) immediately put my hand over it (laughs) because that's all I could think about doing um at the moment and um and so he looked at me and he's like do we need to go clean up and I'm like yeah I'll get the shower started so that was that was really it I mean he wasn't grossed out he didn't make me feel bad about it although one of my biggest fears because we sleep in the same bed is sometimes I have pretty bad leaks in the middle of the night probably once every four months and that has not happened with him in the bed and I think obviously he will be completely great about it like I know he will but I'll probably cry I'll I'll just you know I I'll be embarrassed and it's something that it's not something to be embarrassed about but but there's a little bit of me that just doesn't want to wake up in my own stool and (laughs) probably get it on him too and and I know it'll happen and we've talked about it but it's been um not a big deal so far so I know that it won't be a big deal when that happens too. And I think it's been very easy for us to, I haven't had any real bad leaks during our relationship, especially during intimacy. But, you know, I I did tell Sarah, you know, worst case scenario, this might happen. But the best situation is the fact that it all washes off. You know, worst (laughs) case scenario, we hop in the shower, it washes off and you continue to go about your day. You know, you might not be 100% 100% in the mood after this situation. We have to calm down, relax, and just, re- you know, get back to watching TV or something. But, you know, <laughs> everything watches, washes off. So if the worst case scenario does happen, just breathe a little bit, try to relax, and then take the next steps to clean yourself and clean your partner if anything were to happen. So, Ryan, what was your reaction when <clears throat> Laura had this first leak and, and you kind of felt that something was possibly happening. Uh, relief. 
Of course. Um, I, I love that everything's working correctly. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that means that her body's handling the food that we've eaten in the last 12 hours or last six hours correctly. It means it means that it's moving through her body. It means that it's coming out. You know, we've had lots of experiences with blockages and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, going out to eat and people forget to put the pico de gallo on the side and that just makes me so mad it happened yesterday so <laughs> because, that's why he's saying pico de gallo yeah, very like, specific the, a lot of people <laughs> don't know that you know this is an important detail and it could it could mean us spending the night in the hospital so i i'm always grateful and thankful for the nights that we're not so if you know if she has a leak and and the, the bag rips or or whatever that doesn't mean much to me <clears throat> actually it's quite the opposite it means that everything's working great and that we've made all the right decisions up to this point as far as uh you know nourishing her and putting the right things in her body and if it's if it's going through the motions and and coming out and the, and the bag slips you know then the bag slips but overall i'm i'm very happy with the outcome because that means everything's working just fine yeah and it's not that big a deal i know i've had not times where you know, it wasn't necessarily during intimacy, but I've, you know, been changing my ostomy and it's, you know, been a little bit more active than I would like it to be. And I'm in the middle of changing it. And, and Sarah hasn't even cared. She's actually come up and just wiped stuff away from me when, you know, there was a little <laughs> bit of an accident because, you know, it does just wash away and it is a good sign that things are moving through us, pos- you know, properly and everything is, you know, working the way we want it to. What have your reactions or feelings been when an accident has possibly happened, Sarah? Well, I mean, I will say I think it's definitely harder on you guys, Laura and Brian. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're the ones who have ostomies or and you're the ones who have to live with this. And it's certainly something that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Um, And one of the things that I've said to Brian repeatedly, because I think, you know, like you said, Laura, you know, you're just waiting for that day when it happens and Ryan's in the bed and you say you're going to cry and (laughs) he gets upset sometimes as well if he has any sort of complications or if he has to change his bag too soon, if he's just changed it. And one of the things that I say to him is, you know, I, I love his ostomy because it really has given him his life back. You know, when he, I wasn't with him before he got it, but when he talks about everything that he went through and his quality of life before the ostomy, you know, I love that he has it and I love that he can be an advocate for so many people, but I love it because it allows him to do everything that he wants to do and it lets him live the life that he wants to and he can do half Ironmans and he can go to Mets games and not worry and he can be with me and it's not an issue. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be health issues at some point and that there haven't been, but it really, it's a part of him and I love it just as much as I love his face or any other part of him. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, you're a a little bit. So, um, (laughs) you know, I think the bottom line is the fact that intimacy is not, hard with an IBD or an ostomy, you know, we just have to kind of go with the punches. And if anything happens and we have a good partner that everything's going to be fine, you know, we can wash anything off, wash sheets, and it's not as big a deal as people might think it, you know, can be, you know, it's always going to be a bigger deal for myself or Laura, because we're the ones that are actually, you know, going through it 100%. But if you have a good enough partner, they're going to feel like they're going through it 100% also, and they're going to want to be by your side and be part of it and you know help you out through the process as well. Because it sounds like, Ryan, you're very similar to Sarah. You just kind of want to be there for us and you know make our lives a little bit easier, which you know puts our mind at ease quite a bit. And one of the things that I know is hard for me and something that you mentioned earlier, Laura, is you know kind of survivor's guilt, especially you know if we have to go to the hospital or have to stay in for a night. And what are your kind of thoughts when it comes to survivor's guilt? So uh, survivor guilt is is a huge part of um, how I feel when something comes up. So it's just essentially, you know, being an inconvenience to 
the people that I love. And, and I know in my rational brain that it's not inconvenient for him. He wants to be there, but I feel guilty when he has to stay up all night in the ER with me or take me to doctor's appointments or, or stay in from fun plans we made. But, um, He's so good because he says, you know, I would be so much more upset being away from you right now, knowing that you're not feeling well. And so I think that survivor guilt is something that a lot of people with a lot of different illnesses can have. But um, just talking to your partner and talking about how you feel and how you feel guilty that they're not getting to go out with their friends tonight um, is important. And, And really, like you said, if you have a good partner... They just want to be here for us. I think that I've definitely had survivor's guilt a, a lot of time. You know, like you, sometimes my arthritis is acting up too much or my stomach is acting up. And, you know, I could go out. I could push it a little bit harder. But sometimes you just want to stay on your own couch and, you know, relax and watch TV. And, you know, you might want your partner to still go out and, you know, have fun. But mm-hmm. a lot of the time is, you know, I found, and it sounds like Ryan does the same thing, they just want to cancel the plans entirely and stay home with us because they rather be home with us knowing how we're doing, but also just being able to help us through and just hold us, you know, while we just want to relax, you know, and make our lives a little bit easier. And and I think it's natural for us as the patients to feel a little bit guilty, but in the grand scheme of things, when you're with the right person, there's no reason to feel guilty because they know that these instances are going to pop up they know that it's part of the roller coaster ride and they know that there are going to be nights where you know last second even if we have plans we're going to have to cancel and stay in so ryan i mean it seems like you're completely fine you know riding the roller coaster and obviously going through whatever you know laura goes through with her yeah i mean i i I think it's more selfish on my part because i couldn't i couldn't go out and have a good time knowing that she's out there everyone knowing back at the house in pain, you know, or, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't enjoy a concert if I knew that she, her symptoms were flaring and she was at the house by herself. It's like, it's, it's more of a selfish thing for me. Don't feel guilty because I have to stay. I will not have a good time without you. So it's really all about me again. Yeah. I'm exactly the same actually. And it's been, Definitely one of the things we've had to communicate about the most because Brian really has a little bit of FOMO and (laughs) he really, I guess that extends to me too because he doesn't want me to miss out and he has fear of me missing out on things. So I've had to basically sit down next to him and be like, you need to be quiet and (laughs) accept the fact that I'm not going to go to whatever drinks out with my friends or you know go into the city today I don't have to do that um and I think that's one of the biggest things he's had to accept is that that's part of being with me is that most of the time and not always but most of the time I would rather stay home with him and turn on something on DVR or food channel and just (laughs) you know, relax with him and hold his hand if he's not feeling up to it. And I've had to tell him at times that he shouldn't go out if he feels so miserable because that goes back to his own personal FOMO. He's just had to get used to the idea that he's not making my life harder. You know, it's like you said, Ryan, like I'm being selfish because I want to be with him and I want to not go out and worry about it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I think, uh, first off, my, my FOMO case is real and it's severe. <laughs> um, I think that's part of my IBD journey and living with the ostomy a little bit. You know, I want to kind of make up for lost time and I always want to go out and, you know, enjoy the time with my friends and enjoy time with Sarah doing things. And it's tough for us sometimes. Laura, do you ever fear, feel like the same way? Like you want to kind of push yourself, but you know it's right just to stay in with your partner and relax and just you know, watch a movie with Ryan, even though you want to go out, because not only does he want to stay in and, and see you in a more comfortable position, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's better just to stay in. Right. Oh, definitely. I have a severe, severe case of fear of missing out too. <laughs> um, and I think it kind of stems from the fact that when I was my sickest with ulcerative colitis and I was in a lot of pain, the only thing I that kind of kept me through was like thinking about all of these great things I would do when I was better. And I would totally make this worth 
this life worth the amount of fight that I had to put forth. And so that's like always my thing is like making my life worth the fight. And, um, and so on days where I have to stay in, sometimes I'm like, man, like this is, ugh. and Ryan kind of has to look at me and be like, calm down. Like this is one day. And, and I think also it does help that a lot of the times I do feel well enough and, and we go do awesome, fantastic things. And, you know, I, I don't want to, um, make people think like, oh my gosh, it's just, you know, we stay in all the time and we do that. Like we, we do a lot of things. We go rock climbing, we go paragliding and we jump off of cliffs with parachutes on us. And, (laughs) you know, it's, it's something that he kind of has to remind me of all of the great things we've been able to do in our relationship. And then it kind of calms me down enough to be like, okay, you're right. We should stay in. We can, when I feel better, go and do those awesome, great things. It's something we have to kind of learn. Like that, even though we have missed out and we want to kind of make up for lost time, there still are other days that are going to be better when we can do these things at another time when our bodies are more ready. So I just want to touch base with a couple of questions that have been asked and, uh, you know, that were submitted via social media for all four of us. And the first question that I want to ask, which was posed to me, Laura, uh, quickly, what was your experience like on Tosh.0? And just tell us a little bit of why Daniel wanted to do this piece and, and, you know, why he had you on the show. So for those of you who who don't know my journey, I have a YouTube channel called Asta My Story. I have not posted in two years because I'm a terrible advocate. Um, But um, I essentially documented two years of of my um, IBD journey and my my ostomy journey. And um, so I got a call from uh, Tosh.0 from Comedy Central, and they wanted to do a piece because they, well, one, Daniel actually watched all of my videos and was fascinated. His mom was a nurse, and um, and so he had heard of ostomies before, and, and he wanted to do a piece that was light, and, and at first I said no, but then they kind of came to me, and they're like, how awesome would it be for people to see that you can laugh at all of this? Like, you know, that it's a real serious thing, but also you can laugh at it. And so it was awesome. And they were so good. And even when the camera wasn't rolling, Daniel was asking me so many questions and, and really, really just wanted to understand. And, and so it was awesome. And I just kind of thought, cause I was very nervous going on Tosh.0 because it's not the nicest of humor sometimes that (laughs) if I just went in with the best intentions and just to spread awareness and have fun and, and show people that it's hard, but it's not all hard, um, that it would be worth it. And, and I'm really happy with, you know, how it turned out. I, I wish that the audience didn't groan and moan so much, but you know, that was out of their control. So, um, yeah, no, I, I really had a great time and I'm happy that I got to do it. And I think, you know, when I watched it with my brother, my brother has Crohn's disease also, he doesn't have an ostomy, but you know, we thought that first when we, we heard it was going to be on there, my first reaction was, oh crap. You know, right. what yeah. is going to happen? You know, literally, what is going to happen with Tosh.0 covering a topic like this? But I think they did a really great job of Literally. mixing humor with education, which I yes. think really <laughs> kind of bridged the gap and made it a lot easier for, you know, I, I know I really enjoyed the piece and a lot of other people enjoyed the piece and it made us a lot, a lot easier for us to, you know, watch it. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I've talked to people and even my GI doctor, you know, he says that he has people watch it sometimes and, and people have come up to me and say, this is how I explained it to my best friend. You know, it was a way that it was light and it was fun, but you still got to learn. And, and I just owe so much to them for writing the piece, how they did. Um, it, it was fantastic. And I just was so happy that they actually wanted to educate people too. And, and they made that clear to me that they were going to allow me to actually talk about, um, about daily life as well and not just crack poop jokes, which was great. <laughs> but no, poop I think jokes they did are a my great job. Time. I think they did an excellent job. So some of the other questions that we have asked, Jennifer asked, how do you keep things exciting or do you just do the same routine when it comes to intimacy? And I think this is an excellent question, one that we've mm-hmm. touched on a little bit, but I think for the most part, I mean, there aren't really things that we can't do. Um, you know, we kind of, Sarah and I, 
you know, we research things just like anybody does and, you know, kind of just goes with the flow. And if we choose, we want to do something or experiment or, you know, change our routine a little bit, we do. And it's pretty easy for us. So keeping things exciting for us has been, I think, the exact same way any couple does. I, I would say how to keep things exciting and or in changing things up is the same for anybody without an ostomy or IBD. I mean, maybe you might plan one night to do something exciting and new and then you'll have a flare up or, you know, have an issue with your ostomy and maybe you don't do it that night. But other than that, which by the way, can something can crop up with a normal person, you know, maybe as a girl you get a headache or you get cramps or whatever. So I would say it's no different than anybody else. Oh, the yeah. headache excuse. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually Classic. him using it, though. Uh, Laura and Ryan, I mean, do you guys find it hard to keep things exciting or, or you know, expand out with regards to your relations? I mean, not not for me. I, I'm 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 total. I'm in total agreement with you guys. I, I don't think it's any more difficult for us to try and find ways to spice things up as it is for any couple ever i think there's just as many options and and less limitations it's i I don't think it's i don't think it's that big a deal i don't i haven't seen it it's pretty much normal i mean we go about our routine you know the same way and you know experiment things in the same way so i don't think it really changes anything jennifer i think you know we kind of do things the same way a normal healthy couple would do Mm -hmm. our next question comes from michael and michael asked you ever let the loved one see or change your ostomy laura i'm gonna let you take this one because you changed it in front of a lot of people on tosh.0 um yeah and you know what it's funny because um, I've never really asked him if he wanted to, to see it. He's watched, of course, all my videos, so he's very aware of what I do. Um, so the first time that he actually saw me change it, I think, was probably a couple of weeks ago. And um, and so I thought that I had a little bit of prolapse in my stoma, but it actually turned out that I had a collection that was pushing on it from behind and making it look longer. Um, and so, you know, he came in there and was, was talking to me and, and helping me out. And, you know, I told him, I think that it's prolapse and he knows what prolapse is. He knows like how painful and difficult that can be. And so at that point he was like, I need to sit down. I'm having a hard time. And I thought it was because he was seeing my stoma for the first time. You know, after I changed it, I came out and he's like, not even thinking about the stoma or anything. He's like, you think you have prolapse? So he was more worried about my actual health. But, you know, when it comes to my stoma and and changing my ostomy, I'm sure that he would have no problem changing it for me for some reason if I if I couldn't. But um, it's never just really come up. Well, that was always one thing about her condition that she wanted to kind of keep for herself. Yeah. Um, Not not in a bad way. Like she was scared that I'd see it and go running for the hills. But more that the same way Sarah and I go number two in the bathroom, we like to do it by ourselves. We don't need, we don't need somebody holding our hands while we're sitting there on the toilet, <laughs> you know. And it's, I, I have a feeling it's the same thing for her when you're in the bathroom changing your bag, you know. In more ways than not, it's the same thing. You're you need your private time to do your private thing, mm-hmm. and a lot of the time it's more comfortable when you're by yourself. So yeah, two to what she said i wouldn't have a problem changing it i've seen all the videos i've seen her stoma and all that and it's all good but for the same reason you know we go to the bathroom and shut the door behind us same reason why she does too right yeah i think the same same way i mean i you know when the door is closed the door is closed and we're doing our business privately but sarah saw my stoma pretty early on and i was a little bit nervous to show it to her and mm-hmm. I remember her reaction, you know, she came in and I showed it to her and she was like, that's it. And I was like, yeah, that's it. And she was like, you made a big deal over that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, right. once again, it gets into that mindset that things are a bigger deal for us than it, than it is for the other person. But I mean, what did you feel when you saw my stoma for the first time, Sarah? Well, in keeping with our sense of humor about things, we've joked about his stoma in a number of ways. And just sort of about, you know, how he doesn't really have a butt, so that's kind of his butts on his stomach. So it was fairly early on in our relationship. He was changing his ostomy, I think, for the first time at my apartment. 
um, and he was very nervous about my reaction. And he was like, okay, well, if you want to see it, now's the time. Um, you can come in. And I came in and I was like, all right, what's up? And I kind of <laughs> looked at it and I was like, okay, this is there. And I just kind of had a conversation with him about something else. And he was kind of like, do you not have any other questions about it? And I was like, not really, you know, do you want to show me how you change it in case, God forbid, you know, you can't change it yourself at any point. And uh, I mean, we have a pretty open door policy about this now, you know, sometimes I have to ask him a question while he's in the middle of changing and I just go in and do it. And, <laughs> you know, I see him change it all the time now. It really doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I think getting back to the question, Michael, that you asked, it's just, it's, it's natural and the partners that we have know it's there. So it's not going to be a big deal for them to see it. They're going to, you know, see you change it or see the stoma and they already know it's there. It might be hidden underneath the bag, but you know, it's not going to be a big deal for them because also, you know, they have probably done a little bit of research themselves. They have probably seen pictures of it or something like that. So their reactions are going to be pretty fine and uh, you're not going to have to worry about it too much. The mm -hmm. next question is from Luke and he asked, what would you say to someone who says they don't want to be with you because of your IBD or ostomy. And this is something that we touched on a little bit earlier, Luke, but in, in my mind, if someone straight out told me that they didn't want to be with me, I wouldn't think they were worth my time, they, wouldn't, they weren't worth my energy, and they weren't worth my breath, and I would literally just kind of walk away, and that would be the end of the conversation. Um, Laura, I know mm -hmm. we've really had positive experiences, but what do you think your reaction would be if someone said, I don't want to be with you because of your IBD or ostomy. Honestly, and I know this seems hard to believe, but I think I would be relieved um, just because investing time into a relationship is, it it's exactly that. You're investing so much time and so much energy. And, and so finding out right away that someone didn't want to be with you because of that, you know, thank goodness I didn't marry you and this happened down the road. You know, so I guess I, I really am kind of relieved that I didn't spend a ton of time invested in this person. So, um, I mean, of course it would, it would kind of hurt, but then I would just think of what type of person would, would say that kind of thing. And I, I would be happy that they weren't in my life in that capacity. Exactly. I mean, I've had some people write on social media and some of the forums that, you know, they have a partner that's not really supportive or, or doesn't really like to talk about their IBD or ostomy or anything like that. And I think that right away shows you what kind of character your partner might have. And do you really right. want to be with that person? And if someone says right from the start that they're not sure that they don't want to be with you because of your Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or ostomy, I think it shows what kind of person they are. And you just kind of write them off. So Michelle, our last question of the day asked, how would you discuss intimacy with a younger adult or teenager with IBD or an ostomy? This is a tough question um, and one that, you know, would be very hard to answer for me because I don't have kids yet, but I could easily say that, you know, when they might be the right age or you can kind of tell that they might start to be experimenting or having feelings for you know, a partner or, you know, the cooties kind of go away, you, you might just want to have a normal conversation with that time and, and tell them exactly, you know, some of the things that we've talked about today, you know, if, you know, their friend isn't okay with their ostomy or isn't okay with their IBD and they don't want a relationship, then they're obviously not the right person. And you kind of have to go about your day and, and about your life without them. So mm -hmm. it's a really hard topic to, I think, cover but what are your thoughts, Laura, if you had to discuss, you know, intimacy with a, a younger adult or teenager that has similar circumstances to us? You know, uh, for my work, I talk to nurses about this exact thing, how they can educate their patients, their younger adults, their their teenagers about things like intimacy. And, and for me, it would just be, like you said, making sure that the right person is is not making them feel bad about having an ostomy, but then also giving them resources to make them more comfortable talking about, you know, the different types of lingerie that are available, um, talking about emptying your ostomy, talking about, 
um, making sure you feel comfortable with your partner and having an open discussion, just kind of all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, you know, if you feel comfortable talking about this with the teenager or young adult, I think that just giving them resources and and um, ways to feel comfortable in their own skin because that time in anyone's life, ostomy or no ostomy, IBD or no IBD, you you feel very self-conscious about uh, about your own body, or at least I did at that point of time, and I didn't have an ostomy. Um, so I think that the best thing would just to be open, answer questions, be honest, and, and give them resources. I completely agree. I think another thing also might be, you know, they might want to not take that step to having a relationship yet until they're confident with their IBD or ostomy. Because if you're not confident in yourself and you're not comfortable with yourself, you're probably not ready to bring somebody else into your life. And if you're at that younger age, it's going to be even harder if you're not, you know, prepared to deal with all these things with your Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or ostomy on your own. So I feel like you have to be strong mentally and kind of confident with whatever situations throw, are thrown your way with your disease on your own. So then if you do decide to have a partner with you, you know, it's that much easier to deal with. What do you think, Sarah? Well, I think that really the biggest thing is talking about intimacy with a young adult or teenager. I mean, forget about the IBD and ostomy for a second. You know, if you're going to talk to a teenager or young adult about intimacy, you know, you have to do it in a way that's sensitive and sort of normalizes everything for them and makes them aware that they shouldn't be ashamed of, you know, their bodies, whether it's they're too curvy as a girl or, you know, as a boy, if you, you know, how you're developing and all of that. So I think that's really the first challenge is learning how to discuss that. And then once you can figure out how to have that conversation, you know, you do the same with your ostomy or IBD is you normalize it and you make sure that there is no fear or that they don't feel ashamed of it. Because at the end of the day, that's something that you both had to deal with was presenting your ostomies and IBD in a very positive light and explaining why it's such a good thing. And so, you know, to that end, the other thing you'd have to prepare them for is how to explain it to a partner and you know i mean they're teenagers they're not stupid so they know not everybody has an ostomy and not everybody has ibd so their challenge is going to be how to sensitively and appropriately explain that to a partner prior to being with them so if they're comfortable in their own skin and with their ostomy i i think that they can handle it no i completely agree and i think you know that goes along with you know getting them the proper resources like laura said if you don't have the proper resources when a kid is ready, you know, you're not going to be able to prepare them for the conversations that they might have to have. Well, I think that's all that we have for today. I can't thank our partners, Sarah and Ryan, for joining us. Thank you guys very much for being on the show. No problem. Happy to be here. Yep, our pleasure. And Laura, thank you so much for joining us as well. I think, you know, the four of us together having two IBD patients of different sex as well as two partners of different sex probably was able to help out a lot of people and laura i can't thank you enough for coming on the we will beat ibd podcast as well oh absolutely thank you so much for having us we had a great time and i hope you guys had a good time as well and uh, we look forward to meeting you in the near future all right sounds great thanks again thank you Well, that concludes our fourth episode of the We Will Beat IBD podcast. Don't forget to check us out at www.intenseintestines.org. Please also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. If you want to get the latest updates as soon as we post a podcast, you'll be notified. Thank you once again for listening. And a big thank you to Laura Cox, her boyfriend, Ryan Hausman, and of course, my girlfriend, Sarah Benjamin. Together, we can do amazing things. Together, we will beat IBD. Remember again, before changing anything with regards to your daily treatment and activities, consult your medical professional team.